Okay, continuing in PowerPoint number two. Um, so remember, we finished up with DNA extraction. And one of the things I just want to go back and clarify, let's see if we look here. So DNA extraction just means taking whatever um, cells or material the DNA is in, you know, whether it's bone, teeth, um, epithelial cells, sperm, whatever, <clears throat> and purifying that DNA um, so that then we can do further work on it and try to get to the actual DNA type from the person in terms of the repeating boxcars, okay? So that's what extraction means. It's just getting the DNA in pure form. And remember, there were two main types, traditional, which is basically everything except sperm cells. And then in sexual assault cases where sperm has been identified, you use a differential extraction. So let me run you through a little bit of history. Um, <clears throat> And of course, me being the old fart that I am, um, when I started doing DNA and was trained in it, we were using this older technique. So I'm not gonna put out the big long name for it. You don't um, have to you know, certainly memorize that, but you should know that RFLP was the older type um, of DNA typing. And the first big case, you know, the one that was, was televised in, in terms of DNA, um, typing was during the O.J. Simpson case. And interestingly enough, so I was working at the Illinois State Police Crime Lab during that trial. And one of the things we did um, was all of the DNA analysts would go down to the library and we would actually watch the live broadcasts of um, the person. Her name was Dr. Robin Cotton and she was testifying. Um, I learned so much from that testimony <clears throat> in terms of how not to testify um, because I'm telling you, she was as boring as the day is long. So I learned from her, you know, keep it very short and simple and to the point, or you're gonna put that jury right to sleep because I was falling asleep and for God's sakes, I was a DNA analyst. So anyway, learned a lot from that. But the technique that she was using primarily in that case was this RFLP technique. Now it works the same way as STRs, um, except it wasn't short tandem repeats, they were much longer. So, <clears throat> you know, whereas short tandem repeats could be anywhere between three and seven base pairs, um, RFLP could have uh, tandem repeats that were like 35 base pairs um, and up. So because of that, you needed much more DNA to be able to detect a profile and you needed that DNA to not be degraded. And that's kind of asking a lot when you're dealing with forensic samples because you know we're dealing with decomposing tissues and um, DNA that's been exposed to conditions like high humidity and uh, sunlight, which will break down and degrade the DNA. So um, it was great in terms of being able to differentiate uh, people, um, but you had to have way more of a sample. So for example, for um, to get DNA out of blood, you needed a stain about the size of a dime. For um, sexual assault cases, sperm had to be identified. So right there, um, the, the guys who either had a vasectomy and so they didn't produce sperm or didn't ejaculate, and so you know you didn't have any sperm to work with. They kind of got a free pass. You weren't be able going to be able to detect their profile. So there were certainly limitations with this technique. Um, this is what it looked like. So um, let me point some of this out. Let's you know don't focus on this stuff. But basically, um, it would pick up a. Uh, you know, the same thing with STRs, you would get one set of boxcars from your mom and one set of boxcars from your dad, but they would show up as bands. So for example, here's band one and band two for the victim. Here's suspect one. Um, suspect two, you'll notice only has one band. And so that means that he inherited um, the exact same number of boxcars from both mom and dad. Okay, here, um, this is what a differential extraction um, looks like, and it's actually really helpful. So the female fraction, you'll notice we're just picking up the profile of the victim 
and it matches because the bands line up. When we look at the sperm fraction um, or the F2 fraction, you can see that the bands line up with suspect number one, but suspect number two is not here. So this would be excluding suspect number two. I do wanna caution though, did suspect number two wear a condom? Did suspect number two not ejaculate? You know, so his DNA isn't there, but you know, uh, other sources of information need to be, um, you know, gathered by the investigator to determine that in fact he actually wasn't there. Because of course you can have a sexual assault without leaving a DNA profile. It doesn't mean the sexual assault didn't happen. But in terms of showing things to a jury, I really liked this technique because it's very visual. The jurors can look at this and say, ooh, that lines up. You know, ooh, that lines up. Um, however, huge drawbacks in terms of the, the amount of DNA that you needed. Okay, hey, you guys. So here's an example, okay? So here's a typical button on a shirt. Um, and this would be the size of the blood stain that you would need to be able to move forward with RFLP analysis. Look at over here. This is about the size of basically, um, you know, the dot of an eye made with a pen. That's how much you need for STR typing. So STR, because the repeats, the boxcars are much smaller, it means that you can use much less sample and the sample can be very degraded and you can still get a DNA profile. So it was a huge improvement and that's why it's still routinely used today. It's just a very discriminating um, technique. So now we've extracted the DNA, okay? So we've you know, added our detergent, we've gotten the, the DNA that's present in whatever that sample was, um, and now we have it isolated and it's in a test tube, okay? So it may be a very small amount, it may be very degraded, but now we're going to head on to the next step and we're going to do a process what it, which we call amplifying the DNA. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that DNA and you're gonna put some of the building blocks of DNA in with it, the A's, G's, C's, and T's, and we're gonna add an enzyme that allows us to copy the DNA. But what makes this technique so awesome is that we are only going to amplify the DNA that is present at the 13 STR locations on the different chromosomes that um, are used in forensic analysis. And tons and tons of research has been done on these locations, um, and that's why they were selected. Okay, so um, we're also going to add the enzyme um, is isolated from a bacterium that can reproduce at really, really high temperatures. And because of this, we can make the amplification very, very specific to just these 13 locations. That's what the high temperature does. So the technique that we're using is called the polymerase chain reaction, which is called PCR for short. And PCR is more of a broad technique, okay? The actual technique that uses PCR is STR. And I, I know there's a ton of acronyms here and it can be confusing. So for example, when people are getting tested to see if um, they have um, COVID-19, that testing is also done using PCR. It is a DNA method. So PCR is used in medicine, it's used in forensic science, it's used in agriculture, veterinary medicine, all across the board. It's a very broad-based technique. A interesting fun fact, um, the guy who invented PCR, and you know, when you learn how it works, it's actually so simple. It's like, why didn't we all invent this? Because you know, it really, it's really simple. Um, but his name was Dr. Kerry Mullis, and he has stated that he actually thought of the technique as he was driving down the Pacific Coast Highway in California, which is a very windy um, two-lane road, um, stoned out of his gourd on LSD. So yay, way, way for you know driving intoxicated, Dr. Mullis. But that supposedly is when this you know bright idea came to him. But okay, so we're thankful you know that he came up with PCR because it is such a valuable technique. So 
we use the broad technique PCR to do STR um, analysis on these 13 different locations. Okay. One of the things that defense attorneys bring up um, is that, um, that, oh, you're amplifying DNA. That means that you're creating DNA out of nothing, right? So how do I know that you didn't get my client's DNA and you're just, you know, you're gonna create that to frame him? Well, let me be very clear. So if there's no DNA present from whatever you extracted, let's say it's a vaginal swab from a sexual assault kit, um, you're not gonna get any profile. So you're actually just making copies of the DNA that's already there, okay? So all you're doing is, it's basically like a molecular Xerox machine, and you're just making copies of what's already there so that you have more copies so it can then be detected, okay? So you're not creating any new DNA profile. Um, you know, you're not framing someone. You don't plug in a sequence and say, hey, this matches the defendant. Let's make copies of this you're simply amplifying and making copies of what is already there. So here's how it works, okay? And you know, you don't have to memorize any of this mumbo jumbo, but in terms of doing the actual work, it is so easy. Um, so we, let's say we have a, a shirt from a suspect and we wanna know if that could potentially be the victim's blood. So we're gonna extract the DNA from that blood stain on the suspect's shirt. Um, using our typical DNA analysis methods. And then we're going to find out how much DNA is there in the original sample and then use that to mix up a test tube that has the original DNA from the sample and then the enzyme from the bacteria that can reproduce when it's really hot, like in hot springs. And then we're gonna add some building blocks, the A's, G's, C's, and T's and then other short pieces of DNA called primers, which um, help us amplify just those 13 areas. And then we put it on the test tube, we put it in this handy dandy machine called a thermocycler, and uh, excuse me, thermocycler, and then we press go, and then guess what? The analyst gets to walk away while the machine does all of the hard work, come back in about three and a half hours, and boom, you're done. And you've taken theoretically one copy of the DNA from the sample, and at the end of three and a half hours, now you have millions of copies of just the 13 locations from that original DNA, okay? So you're just, it's an amplification of what is already there. And really what the machine is doing for you, the thermocycler, is it heats up the DNA really hot, lets the primers adhere, lets it cool a little bit, and then it makes a copy, and then it repeats that process again and again and again. So here is an exciting, beautiful photograph of what a thermocycler looks like. Um, so a lot of times in the crime lab, we would get our reactions ready, put them in the thermocycler um, before lunch, press go, and then come back you know, after lunch and wait a couple hours. Um, and then it would be done. So the machine is doing the hard work for us. So from one copy of DNA, and all you need is one, we now have millions of copies of that DNA, and now we're ready to actually detect it and be able to see what that DNA profile looks like. So the technique that is allowed to, that allows us to do that is called capillary electrophoresis, okay, which I know is a mouthful. Once again, it's really easy to understand. Scientists love to put big old words next to stuff that, you know, actually are pretty simple. Um, we call it CE for short, and it's done in this big old machine um, that stands about, God, I want to say three to four feet tall, um, sits on, you know, a countertop, has a computer that goes with it, um, and it's pretty darn expensive, okay? This also prevents people from just being DNA analysts in their basement because all of this equipment um, is, you know, really expensive. And of course, if you're gonna be declared an expert in forensic testimony, you have to be using the most up-to-date methods um, and machinery. Okay, so basically what happens is once it runs through capillary electrophoresis, that allows us to visualize the profile 
and this is what it looks like. So for me, this is a little less jury friendly because it kind of looks like chemistry data, which freaks people out a little bit. But basically what you're seeing here is all of the different locations of DNA. Okay, so on this particular sheet of paper, we have nine locations plus a gender marker, which we call amylogenin. Okay, so at the first marker, the person's type would be a 1415. So what that means is that on one of the chromosomes they inherited, there were 14 repeats or boxcars, and on the other chromosome they inherited, there are 15. We can't tell which one came from mom and which one came from dad, but there's two of them there, and we know that they were inherited from um, this person's parents. Okay, at the next location, the person's type would be a 1718. At this third location, they would be a 2324, and so on. The gender marker here shows us that this DNA profile is coming from a female because females, remember, have two X chromosomes. And so the only chromosome that shows up is an X. If this sample were coming from a male, you would see an X and then a Y chromosome. Okay. So I'm gonna stop there, and then we're gonna finish up PowerPoint number two, talking about mitochondrial DNA um, in our next video, but I'm gonna get this one uploading. Okay, thank you very much.